Hello. And a very warm welcome to the Greater Birmingham Solihull Lab series of online events uh, on resilience, evolution and recovery. I'm Louise Brooks-Smith, I'm a board director here at the LEP and I'm chair of our place board. We will be getting into the main session shortly, but um, I'd like to be able to show a short film on some of the work we've, uh, we have done and, and the difference that it's making across our area. It's been a year like no other, but here at the GBS LEP, we continue with our central ambition to drive inclusive economic growth. From Birmingham to Bromsgrove, East Staffordshire to Redditch, Wire Forest to Cannock Chase, Solihull to Tamworth and Lichfield. GBS LEP has been working towards our ambition of making your city region the best place to live in and to work in. In Birmingham City Centre, phase one of the Paradise Development opened up this year. I was very excited at the thought that had been given to the way in which the, uh, the new buildings were going to complement uh, and help reveal some of the old sight lines of Birmingham. And now, as phase one's finished and phase two's coming on stream, I mean, it's great to see new restaurants are here and occupants for the offices that are here. Uh, and it's just great to see Paradise come to life. Away from the city centre and to Perry Bar, we've also allocated money to Birmingham City Council's build of the Alexander Stadium for the 2022 Commonwealth Games. Our investment in infrastructure enables job creation across the region, including Redditch Gateway. The whole project is absolutely vital for the people of Redditch. The current climate with Covid and everything, I think having jobs coming to this town is absolutely key right now. Over in Litchfield, the completion of this bridge on the Southern Bypass means there's access to a new housing development. Ensuring our residents have the best access to public transport is also a key achievement. In Kidderminster, a brand new station for commuters and staff. I think it's fantastic. I mean, the station itself looks beautiful, state-of-the-art, eco-friendly. It attracts people to come to the station. I enjoy coming to work in the morning to look at my new station. But in order to grow our economy, we need our residents to have the right skills and training. Over 1,000 apprenticeships have been created through partnership work. At Chase Terrace Academy in Burntwood, it's full marks from this Level 3 teacher assistant. I find it's really helped with my confidence being able to obviously learn, but also work as well. It's given me the experience as well as the learning opportunity. This year also saw the start of the Inclusive Commonwealth Legacy Programme. It's aimed at developing capacity and capability for diverse owned businesses to win contracts regionally and globally. I've gained a lot of knowledge in a short amount of time. I've been looking to find people like this and they're right on my doorstep. So the NET programme has been a, 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 a fantastic resource. But of course it's not been plain sailing. COVID-19 has had a huge impact on businesses, so we stepped up with Step Forward, our ongoing campaign to help with resilience, survival and recovery. Over in Sutton Coalfield, the Town Hall is pivoting its services. By getting the money to invest in weddings, we now feel we've got a new lease of life, um, not just to compete with other people, but to be ahead. And right across our towns and local centres, we're working with our public, private and educational sectors, creating a sense of place and belonging, from Bromsgrove to Shirley to Soho Road. It's been a busy year, and there's still plenty more to come. I hope that gave you a flavour of, of what we're doing here. Um, now, today's session, as you might be aware, has been changed slightly um, following a few technical issues during the week. Um, we're now going to be hosting one main session with three of the four subjects covered, hopefully within the next hour or so. We are still going to be focusing on how we reimagine our town centres. We will include an, an international case study from Sweden, as well as examples of the work we're doing over our nine local authority areas that form the LEP region. You will still have the opportunity to make comments via our chat bar and to ask questions live um, in the closing session uh, through the Q&A panel. So thank you for bearing with us and joining what 
I know is going to be an interesting and, and, and I hope thought provoking event, especially given the very recent announcements from Debenhams, Arcadia and Bon Marche this week. They're not, you know, the, the, the pretty horrendous um, uh, news announcements, which have followed on the heels of so many well known names. Not only will our shop fronts change, the impact on jobs and local economies will also need to adapt. And, and this is where the likes of LEPS can and do make such a difference while we all move to new trading patterns. So a bit of an intro for those who don't know much about us. Here at the Greater Birmingham Solly Hull LEP, as part of our overall work to support the region, we're working to help optimise our physical, cultural and environmental assets. At the same time, we're working to improve our physical and digital connectivity. Our ambition is to create inclusive and exciting places to live, work, visit and of course invest in. We're here to enable the creation of a globally connected city region with all of our surrounding towns and local centres contributing to the, econ the economic fabric of our region. Now the LEP has already carried out significant work to support our towns and local centres through the development of, a, of, of our towns and local centres framework. We've commissioned ecosystem research, growing our towns report, focused on highlighting the opportunities and assets across 10 key locations, which identified a range of activities where investment will support good placemaking. It's all about placemaking and livability. We have also established a town centres network to share best practice and knowledge, ensuring we learn from each other and coordinate our approaches, building on the partnerships across the region. We've delivered over £700,000 worth of funding to support projects across our area. We provided £81,000 to support the development of place-based cultural activity across the geography from the Jewellery Quarter in Birmingham to the Creative Corners in Cannock. We do all of this with our intelligent gathering locally by working with our public, private and academic partners. Um, and it's that last word which is vital, partners and partnerships. No one body or organisation can do it on their own. We have to work together. Now, talking of partnerships, it is my very great pleasure to launch today um, a new report, uh, which is entitled A Toolkit for Delivering Economic Value Through Heritage Impact. Trust and Historic England to really get under the skin and understand how investment in heritage can deliver economic value in our area. It makes a number of recommendations. Now we know that heritage can support innovation by creating a dynamic environment for startups and entrepreneurs. It can attract talented people to live and work in a particular area and promote their well-being and make a valuable contribution to our sense of place and identity. People are attracted to heritage. Now the report promises to be a beneficial toolkit for investees and assessors alike. And at the LEP, we consider the recommendations carefully um, uh, and we are going to be looking at more of the recommendations over the coming months. We hope it's going to target strategic investments in heritage by creating a framework to facilitate the development of some very, very important projects. Now you can find the report on our website um, for which I believe that there are links on the resources page. Now, as I said, um, our work in local towns is an integral part of our ambition to enhance the Greater Birmingham and Solly Hulls area and its position as a thriving connected city region. Here's a taste of how we're helping. We're working with towns and local centres right across our nine local authority areas to create better places to live in and to work in. In Shirley, £50,000 has been allocated to improve the town centre by working with Solihull Council and local businesses to develop an action plan. It'll maximise the high street's distinctiveness. It's really important to invest in a high street like Shirley because we know that small independent businesses are at the heart of the economy. For locals though, it's not just a retail centre, but also a place to come together. There's a 
quite a, a large community uh, feeling and I think to be able to continue to operate their businesses will reinforce that community feeling. In northwest Birmingham, the multicultural area of Handsworth has also had a boost thanks to investment from us. It's enabled Soho Road Business Improvement District to draw up a plan for improvements. Well, it's an epicenter of a diverse culture. Um, I mean, it's businesses here. We, we represent over 700 and it's, it's their livelihood. It's our livelihood. And, you know, we, we need this to be at the level of other top sh shopping centres. Uh, we don't want to be in the doldrums now. We want to be at the top and this, hopefully this report will get us there. Through our towns and local centres framework, we've already allocated over £700,000 of funding to support projects. We continue to look at ways of reimagining our local centres in light of COVID-19. And joining us now is Mike Parker, who's Corporate Director for Prosperity and Place at Wire Forest District Council. Mike is going to share how the LEP is helping in his local place. And I'm delighted to say that we funded a number of projects in Wire Forest, but I'm not going to talk about them. Mike is. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Louise, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this week's series of LEP events, and I'm just going to spend a few moments talking to you about the work we've been doing with the LEP in Kidderminster. Um, Louise mentioned the Growing Our Towns report earlier, and Kidderminster was one of the 10 towns featured in that report. Um, for those of you who perhaps aren't familiar with Kidderminster, um, it was an 18th and 19th century carpet manufacturing town, uh, at one point about a fifth of the population was employed in that industry and unfortunately in the 1980s along with uh, much of manufacturing that manufacturing industry also declined. Um, it left a legacy in the town of industrial sites um, used primarily for the, the manufacturing of the carpets but centred around the two waterway systems that run through the town, the River Stour and the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal. Now, principal amongst those sites, and most synonymous perhaps with carpet manufacturer, was the Brinton family, and the Brinton site sat right in the heart of the town. Um, the, the town also has uh, perhaps undergone some rather brutal architecture and infrastructure in the 1960s and 70s, um, not least of which was the Inner Ring Road, which runs from the north to the south of the town and around the east, and uh, severed a number of communities that now sit outside of the town. So it feels that, that for the number of years I've worked at Wire Forest, to, it, to some degree, we've been unpicking the work of our, our peers and our forefathers in trying to get the town back onto its feet again. <clears throat> and of course, the, the town has suffered as have all towns recently um, from decline. And we know that that's been accelerated by the current pandemic. Um, so what was our response to that then? Well, um, it goes back to, to 2009 under something that we called our Rewire Initiative. Um, and that was our flagship regeneration uh, brand that we started to use to be much more proactive. It, it, it enabled us to have a vision for the town. Um, it enabled us to align some of our council functions important um, to the development of the town. So planning, regeneration, property, housing, um, which have always been aligned and have been successful in, in town development uh, long, long in the past. Um, so we use that initiative as well to start pulling together funds. Um, unusually for a small district council like Wire Forest, um, we put quite a lot of capital and revenue into driving forward our regeneration plans. Um, and that, that also enabled us to, to get partners to support us, um, both with the narrative and also with the finances for that as well. Um, none more so than the LEP, and we've been a very proud partner working with the LEP 
Um, and the Let bought into that narrative immediately and have been immensely supportive in enabling us to move forward with the future of the town. Um, to give you some examples, and you saw on, on a couple of those uh, videos there, some of them, um, infrastructure has been really important to us being able to drive forward the development of the town. And you saw on the video the, the new Kidderminster Rail Station and Forecourt. Um, that's certainly been a, a transformation for us in uh, Worcestershire's second most busy rail station. Um, and it's now got a, a rail a ticket office and, and uh, arrangements that are commensurate with that level of usage. Um, also, we're, we're uh, almost at the tail end now of delivering a £6 million highway infrastructure project, um, which has enabled us to move forward on our Churchfields Urban Village Master Plan. Um, again, a site just outside the Ring Road, but for all intents and purposes, part of the town centre. It'll enable us to bring forward about 300 houses on brownfield land there, and a, a super um, addition to the town centre. In, in terms of ac actions within the town centre, the council over the, the, the last few years has been investing in improving where we can. We're not large landowners in the town, but we have uh, put in with our county council colleagues about £2 million worth of public realm improvements, um, creating a more of a sense of place in the town now. And latterly, the LEP has been uh, instrumental in helping us open up a previously pedestrianised part of the town in Worcester Street. Now, that's been important to us because going back to that legacy of Brinton family uh, interest in the town, a significant part of the town to the west was vacant as part of that decline in the manufacturing industry. And the response to that has been that um, we've now got something called Weaver's Wharf, which is a fantastic addition to the town, but it's basically a retail park that's been bolted onto the town. And whilst it's certainly supported the town and enabled us to capture expenditure that otherwise would have leaked out of the district, it's also been part of the problem with the town. Um, it lies to the west, um, it's a modern industrial park and naturally uh, a number of the, the traditional high street stores have moved into that area, which has left the eastern part of the town much more in decline, not least Worcester Street. And the reason for opening it up to traffic was to try and get some footfall and activity back in that part of the town. Most of the council's attention of late has been focused on the eastern part of the town, an area we designated as Lionfields, and we've looked at bringing forward development of that, of which Worcester Street was part of. Um, but the LEP has also supported us to work on some feasibility studies on part of our Bromsgrove Street car park, which is part of that Lionfields site to the east. Um, it's enabled us to develop some feasibility work, which has been instrumental in us being successful in our future high streets fund bid. We were one of the lucky first 50 to be invited to bid and we're waiting with bated breath at the moment as I'm sure a number of colleagues are for the outcome of that bid we're expecting to hear um, almost literally any day. Um, but without the support of the LEP we wouldn't have had such a persuasive narrative to make our bid so successful. Perhaps more importantly for today's conversation and uh, the latest element of support we've had from the LEP um, is around a visioning piece for the town which aims to bring together all of that future high streets fund and other town centre opportunities but looking forward 20 years so I branded it Kidderminster 2040 and it was conceived before the pandemic but um, given where we are at the moment with with the Covid world and the need as Louise had said to reimagine our towns um, never has there been a time where we need to think creatively about reimagining our towns and the LEP were able to support us with funding to enable a commission that we're about halfway through at the moment which is going to be I think immensely insightful into what the future of the town might look like as we work over the next 20 years. Um, the LEP has been immensely supportive as a partner and uh, I can honestly say that without their support we wouldn't have been able to achieve a number of those things that I've mentioned in this short presentation. We look forward to continuing to work as a partner and we look forward to continued success. Um, now I know I've only been able to give you a whistle stop feel there of Kidderminster but I am around for the whole of this event uh, including networking at the end and if anybody's got any questions in any more detail they would like me to expand on I would be very happy to do that but in the meantime I'll hand you back to Louise and on to our next speakers. Thank you.
Thanks ever so much, Mike. Um, and I think it's a really good example of what can be done. Um, it takes people and it takes vision, um, but it can be done. And, and it would be excellent to get some reaction from um, all of those who are listening and watching today. Um, because a lot of these things can be replicated uh, across the region and the LEP is here to be able to help support and facilitate where we can. So now on to our next speaker, um, who is joining from Sweden. Um, Bjorn Bergman has been CEO of the Swedish Association of Towns and Cities since 2012. Um, that's a national non-profit membership company. He's also chair of the Congress uh, and Events in Southern um, Sweden a regional public company, and he's the former chair of Destination Malmo. Prior to this, Bjorn was the Director of Trade and Industry for the City of Malmo and the CEO of the City Centre Partnership. So safe to say he knows a thing or two about uh, how town, town centres and how they can adapt and how a Scandinavian approach could possibly be adopted here in the UK. So, um, Bjorn. Over to you. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to join you though I wish I would have been uh, with you in, in Birmingham. But I, I'm giving this uh, talk from Malmo, my hometown. And uh, for you all football lovers, you understand that this is the capital, the football capital of Europe. Uh, I'm happy I'm the only one being able to speak at the moment. Uh, I'll give you a uh, short brief about the situation in Malmo in, uh, a few, uh, in Sweden and uh, some examples from Sweden. Uh, before the pandemic already, we could see a change in our, the downtown areas or town center areas. We were going from a marketplace more to a meeting place. But, but still in the city center, we, we find all the local very important independent local entrepreneurs who actually is the the they're very important for the place branding uh, but unfortunately they have a very weak economy mostly and are very are suffering really bad from the pandemic uh, and just a short update we in sweden we haven't had any lockdown but uh, many retailers are suffering very hard um, in general, we've lost about 50% of the footfall in the city and the turnover has been really bad. Um, but we've also found out that the partnerships in, in different uh, cities uh, have been very important to bridge over the uh, information and the communication between the public and the private uh, sector. Uh, and, but we've also seen a lot of very creative initiatives. In the picture here, is a, a women's fashion store called Liebling in Malmo. They found out that the customers were afraid to, to go into the store to try on uh, their clothes. So they created this dressing room outside. And uh, so very simple, but very efficient. People could try on the new dresses outside. We've seen lots of these uh, initiatives. In this picture is a local florist. Uh, where you can order by phone and they have a drive-in. You honk uh, when you park outside and they come out with the flowers and you pay by your phone. Very, very simple and, and easy. We, I think we all share the, uh, the uh, challenge of not knowing when all of this is over and none of us know what will be the new normal, but we know a few things. There will be empty premises and we need to create footfall in the, uh, the centers. So looking forward, what, this is the perfect time, I think, to stop and think about what kind of town center do we actually want in the future? We could see that we need innovation and we need, need new business models. We have to adapt to the faster digitalization. And I think we have to adapt to a decreased consumption. 
we won't see much of tourism for quite some time. And we also uh, know that the e-commerce will speed up. We, need, we understand that more people will work from home more often. Uh, and uh, we also understand that there will be less need for office space and we need to find out what to do. We also see the, the importance of beautification and uh, new concepts. And I'd like to share with you one concept that is actually the neighbor to my office. Uh, it's called Beyond Us. And it's actually an urban market micro department store. And the funny thing about this place is that it, it has a shopping shop with 20 different brands, mostly uh, e-retailers -re uh, using this as a showroom. They have all kinds of stuff in there. It's art, jewelry, candy, fashion, interior, decoration, etc. They also have style for rent, which is kind of a new business model to rent your dress. But they also have goods delivery. They have a postal pickup point with dressing room and return services to give that collect moment a uh, shopping experience. And uh, they also have a workspace where the, you can rent your office, uh, office hotel. They have conferences facilities. They have a cafe and bistro. They have a tattoo studio. They have Insta zones for that perfect Insta moment. They have a workout studio and it keeps reinventing itself all the time. But the important thing about this place is that it's actually invented and established by a national property owner. So they are their own tenant. And this is really something new, I think. So moving on quickly. Uh, just a few things about the, the future of our city centers. Sustainability is very important for the future. And uh, uh, city logistic is something that we talk quite a lot about in, in uh, Sweden. And this is an example of a city logistic transportation system where heavy uh, transports uh, comes to a terminal outside of the town it's loaded to this uh, very environmental friendly electrical van. And then the goods are delivered into the city center. Uh, so the retailers uh, gets their um, different uh, pro products from different producers all at the same time. And the, they also pick up the garbage and deliver it to a micro terminal. And then it's transported to a, um, a um, recycling uh, central. Cities need to be welcoming. This lamp is uh, showing, uh, it's placed in different places all around the city of Malmo to be a welcoming light for everyone. Something fun and something that actually attracts them to come to the city. And I'll stop with this very family friendly uh, thing called a ski slope in the southern in the northern part of Sweden in Piteå. This is actually a parking garage uh, but in the winter time it's designed to be somewhere where you can ski or go sledging. I don't know if, if I have some more time but yes. I have a few more minutes. I'll go on. This is a picture from Stockholm. And I talked about beautification and the need for it for all to, to bring people to the city center. And I think every town in the world have, could afford, like Stockholm, 63 cherry blossom trees. And you create the perfect instant moment at least two weeks a year. But to make the uh, shopping an experience, to be creative, um, I love this picture because it says down here, my beloved everyday hero Bjorn. Uh, I don't think it was meant to me, but uh, still, I still love the picture. Uh, culture and art is an important part of uh, creating a city. This is a mural painting of Alfred Nobel in uh, Bourges, and it's a part of the 
um, the street art festival in Bohus, and they have lots and lots of these type of mural paintings. But finally, I think most of us share the love for our home city, and this is something that means that it's very important for us to struggle on every day and uh, try to attract people to our city centers. Thank you so much. Leon, thank you so much. It's brilliant to be able to see what's happening elsewhere, because um, that's the only way that we are going to be able to learn and share and, and just be able to, uh, to, 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 to look at the good practice that's taking place. I have to say, I'm not, I'm not that sure about your football claims, um, but I do know Malmo is, uh, has got a very nice bridge. And I really do like the idea of, of renting dresses. I know that sounds really a, much of a cliche, but, um, but best of all, I think I like the lamp. I like the lamp that is it can be moved around various local centres. I think that's a, a fantastic idea and, and a really good um, symbol of what's happening. And there's a lot of the points there, um, Bjorn, that I know that will be picked up later. So please do um, do remember all those people watching and listening. Um, do feel free to um, add into the chat bar and we can pick some of these themes up later on. Now, this is where we're going to change the format very slightly. Um, we are going to continue with the main event, but everybody's going to be involved with everything. So you don't have to choose particular breakout um, um, areas. We're going to be covering the, the, the topics of culture, community, engagement and waterways. Uh, and we are joined by some expert speakers who are going to provide some, a brief insight into some of the work that they are currently doing across our region. First up is culture with a session exploring how we can best ensure that culture plays its part in the reanimation, sorry, reanimation of our high streets and beyond. So what do we mean by culture reanimating our high streets and centres? Well, a bit like in, in, uh, as highlighted by Beyond in Sweden, we know that our, our, our centres need to change to offer something different, now more than ever, we also need to give people reasons to come back into our centres to feel safe and to feel welcomed. So what are the opportunities? Vibrant programmes of events and festivals, art events, public art and activities can, enc can encourage community to come and watch and to take part. Culture also needs to include supporting smaller businesses, providing scope to rethink shared space, enabling bespoke cultural shops and studios, giving businesses the chance to operate at lower cost and to reach more people, including through markets where makers can come together. With so much empty space on our high streets um, and in town centres, we have the best chance right now to experiment with, two, uh, with new ways of using those temporary spaces, um, reanimating our streets with culture, experimental and community-based activity. Longer term ambitions are still vital though. Seeing culture as a catalyst of regeneration, including heritage investment is key how we can move forward. It, it can be also key to branding and to drive long term footfall. It's a driver for inclusive uh, growth and community cohesion, supporting well-being, mental health, and perhaps reaching those previously harder to reach groups. It can build social capital, supporting people and their needs and create a different approach to oppo opposed to just simply um, concentrating on a traditional retail offer, which we know no longer works in isolation. So there are lots of opportunities for us to change the way we do things, including with the opportunities, particularly in, in our region, by the, uh, the opportunities offered by the Commonwealth Games where we can make those connections with culture to create a lasting legacy for the area. Now, we're gonna to move to our second theme, which is all about uh, um, community engagement. And we've got the fabulous Imandeep Civic Square, who's gonna outline some of the work she and her team have been doing at 
about um, engaging local communities. Now, Imi is the co-founder and director of Civic Square and previously ran the Impact Hub here in Birmingham. Civic Square is a public square neighbourhood lab and creative and participatory platform, I'm quoting obviously, uh, but that is it, in a, in a, you know, it does what it does, it says on the tin, and it's focused on regenerative civic and social infrastructure within neighbourhoods. Uh, Imi is part of a creative and dynamic leadership team who work alongside the local neighbourhood to offer a bold approach to visioning, building and investing in civic infrastructure for neighbourhoods of the future. Imi, over to you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for the uh, lovely introduction. I'm going to probably be talking quite quickly as I move through this over the next seven minutes. Um, as Louise said, I, I also used to be the co-founder of Impact Hub Birmingham and I want to sort of go through the journey a little bit to tell you about how for us community isn't something that you just have to go and engage at the last minute to get planning permission or to get a few thoughts or a bit of consultancy as to what might happen but actually is at the core of um the more equitable regenerative um town city centers that we we need in the future um i'm part of a collaborative studio of um different organizations um from open desk which is about open source um furniture and supply chains to open source housing through WikiHouse and Dark Matter Labs. And this was really important for me to mention because uh, we talked right at the beginning of this session about how the challenges that we're going to face and we are facing um, right now and in the future, um, we know about and we also know that no one organisation alone or one movement or one sector or one type of finance or one type of approach will be able to um, completely solve it alone and so even in the makeup of how we work we're part of a, a family of organizations that um, are working on different layers of, of, of the challenges that we face. Um, we started back many years ago just as a movement of citizens who set up a, a one-day event called TEDx that ended up going from two people in a coffee shop to more than 2,000 um, in, a, in a voluntary movement um, where they were were really envisioning what the future of their places could be like. And that has grown over the last eight to 10 years through the work that we've done. So it's not a quick engagement process that we just do. It's actually building um, that real capacity, dreaming capacity, that, um, that space uh, for citizens and residents and neighbors to really be part of how their places grow. We set up the Impact Hub in the centre of the city um, six years ago through a crowdfunder. We co-designed and co-built it. Um, and the biggest thing we learned from here is that there's no shortage of people, no shortage of ideas, no shortage of wonderful old buildings that we can repurpose into um, beautiful spaces. This was an event space. It was a co-working space. We did many different programmes um, around community housing, children and families. It was absolutely packed um, for six full years. And the issue isn't that there aren't enough people or there aren't enough ideas or there aren't people who want to go to places or need places to gather across um, their, the, the, the spaces they work in or the sectors that they work in. We realise very, very quickly that underneath this sits a complex, um, messy space of land and values and landlords and who's allowed to occupy where and how and on what terms and on what finance. And that until we started to really um, grapple with this, we would just have these beautiful pop-up spaces um, that work for a while and then the people who create that value very rarely can can um, get that back and end up being pushed out um, which is essentially what happened to us in Digbeth and happened to many many of us before before that but not because of bad people but because of systems that we need to grapple with if we're going to really talk about what convivial equitable um, climate resilient just futures look like for our neighbourhoods so over that time, we very quickly realised there's no point going into a battle with landlords. We started to design what the future looked like. What would the future of, of infrastructure like this look like? And one of the things we realised quite quickly was we wanted to move out into the centre, into a neighbourhood and build a really deep demonstration of what's possible. And that's where we started to build quite a sophisticated theory of change where you can see in this diagram, there's a there's a 
Convivial Anchor, the platform, the public square, which I'll share in a few seconds about what that looks like. On top of it is all the beautiful things we see and feel, the culture, the festivals, the things that you go to, the, the great ideas for Instagram that we've heard mentioned today, um, you know, community housing, all the beautiful things that citizens can get involved in. But it's generally what people feel comfortable with funding and investing in. They know how to say we need a bit of art and culture on top of this. We need to repurpose that building. But what we realise is underneath that is tons and tons of things that we call dark matter, how things are owned, how land is owned, how we're looking at um, where where value was created, where it's shared, what we're doing with data, how our buildings are made. And we decided that we needed to go into a deep long term demonstrator, not because lots of civic squares all over the world isn't important, but we really need to grapple with some of the core issues that are driving um, us uh, into some quite scary directions when it comes to climate and ecological um, breakdown and um, and what that means for our everyday lives, some of which we're experiencing now um, through this pandemic. And so we did lots and lots of work and I've shared this, I'll share the slides for anyone who's interested into looking at a lot of these phenomena. This was really about what happened at the New York High Line when a lot of regeneration happened and how it could have been financed and shared differently. We did lots of work and are still doing work with um, the, the team at Donor Economics Action Lab with the economist Kate Rayworth, looking at how we create metrics and spaces and places that can sit within um, what humans, neighborhoods, places need to thrive, but where we don't consistently overshoot the planetary boundaries um, and, and create ourselves more and more future challenges. Um, so we did a lot of work on this and started to um, uh, look around for the last two years of the hub at what was coming up in the area what was a place in the city where we felt at home were legitimate and this site came up as part of a joint venture in Port Loop which is a joint venture between Urban Splash, um, Canal and River Trust, Birmingham City Council um, and Places for People and at this stage we started to put together um, a vision for what it could look like to have a convivial public square at the heart of a neighbourhood that is about to experience massive regeneration that will of course displace some people, will of course make things better for some people will make some people very happy some people very angry but at the heart of it is a beautiful beautiful asset rich community that if is unlocked could make this an absolutely beautiful exemplar of what real regenerative um, inclusive um, uh, processes could look like and this was prior to covid and we were talking a lot about how the unit of the neighborhood would absolutely be the future because we're going to see people more and more um, convene around a range of local centres where they don't want to be driving a long way to commute, where people want to be able to move between different convivial beautiful places and so we were talking about that and then Covid happened and kind of proved how much people want more infrastructure nearby where you can do lots and lots of your everyday life, not all of it but lots of it. So we're a team of lots and lots of different people, as you can see, and this was us last year when the first homes were going up. Um, and we put together a plan of what the 21st century infrastructure we thought felt um, very, very important to be in the future of neighbourhoods. And I'm going to really quickly talk about this because what we are going through at the moment is a period of the economist um, Carlotta Perez talks about a period of great transition of technological and ecological. And we've been through these before, industrial, many, many others. Um, and at those times, key infrastructure was put into place to really help um, societies to pivot through them. One such example was the Carnegie Libraries during um, uh, a period of time where we were going away from factory working to more machine and technological working. And places like libraries were a place where you could access the tools and resources in your community to, to have access to knowledge to transition really well. And right now I always say that, you know, if I could do this to a retrofit of the public libraries, I absolutely would, but that's not in my remit. So imagining what could be possible somewhere is really quick key part of this. So some of it is some of the things you'll understand, workspaces, places to gather, to meet, 
um, artist studios, work offices, cycle hubs, children and family spaces. But some of it is really, really deep looking at the, the supply chains and the factors that sit behind much of this. So the maker factory is very much looking at uh, neighborhood retrofit, looking at repurposing small sites, looking at um, what could happen in a neighborhood when communities are more involved in its development, not instead of big developers, not instead of the city council, but not instead of the combined authority, but together this movement and small and big creating these um, these neighborhoods of the future and the same is um, for community kitchens, food, food insecurity. Um, some of it is much more what you see and feel and experience on an everyday and some of it's really looking into how are we going to make and create together? How are we going to create more local wealth and mo more local access to um, resources and, and uh, things like food and growing, etc. And so this is a little bit of what we went back to um, the developer with those old buildings you saw could be this convivial, beautiful public square where people come together to be able to both access, do normal things like cup of, a cup of tea and connect, but also have access to tools and uh, ideas that are really about building um, future neighbourhoods. Um, and we put lots of plans like this together. We started to do events in the neighborhood. This was Play Out Till Tea in 2019, where we were bringing together older um, residents in the area who'd been there for a long time and really passionate about what was happening and fearful and new residents who were moving in and put them together in spaces of play and growing, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been doing that and then COVID hit and everything sort of blew up in the air. Um, so for the last six months, we've been um, using the canal side to run um, a uh, outdoor cafe where we've been bringing new and old residents together, doing lots and lots of different things um, to really start to build those bridges, break down that fear of what's coming and what what already exists, take down these false binaries that regeneration will just improve everybody's lives as if there is no asset base already there and actually coming together for a shared vision of what a wider, more beautiful, um, convivial, connected neighbourhood could look like and where spaces like these new public parks are shared spaces where we can all imagine better futures together. And so we've been doing lots and lots on that. I don't have time to talk about it all. This is some of what we'll be doing next. Um, and it's part of being at the heart of a, a broader, more participatory neighbourhood. There's lots and lots of work on this that we've been doing around what are the features of a, uh, and what are some of the ingredients of a participatory neighbourhood and how do you start to foster them? And some of them have we've already started to do. And of course, COVID has has um, changed a lot of that. So you can find out more about us at Civic Square um, on our website and our first phase called the front room, which is really about the warm um, welcome and the space to build trust, connection and bridge. And what I kind of want to finish off with saying is that for us, um, community and citizens aren't somebody that you just get to through a set of engagement activities at a key time in your planning activity or at a time where you need to ask a question. But actually, if you foster and invest in them in your places, they start to become the lifeblood of what the future can look like. And I really want to encourage um, more of us to think about that. I'll be around for Q&A. Um, thank you so much for listening. Amy, thank you so much. Um, inspirational as ever. And, and for those of you who've heard Amy speak about um, her work, um, there is so much going on. And um, I wish we had all morning just to talk about that and all that, that everyone else has been speaking about. It's, it, there, is just, there is so much going on. There's so much enthusiasm and so, many, so much good stuff coming out. And um, regardless of, of 2020 being quite a shit year, forgive the language, but you know, there's so much that has come to the fore that is good and we can replicate and improve and, and add it into our proposals and our, 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 uh, our reimagining for uh, 2021 and moving forward. And I'd certainly endorse the um, Kate Rainworth's Donut Economics book for those um, that are into land use economics. Um, it is a really good, a good book that puts things into perspective. So thank you, Amy. Um, we're now going to go into our last topic. And just before I pass um, um, over to um, Christian, we are, because of the number of questions that are coming in, um, I uh, and the production team have taken the decision to, to extend this session. So hopefully we will be able to take on board a lot of the comments and we're going to extend it through till about 12.30. So I do hope that you can all stay with us 
um, um, which would be great. And we can have a little bit of a discussion uh, with the panel members. So without more ado, we are now going to talk about historic waterways and how waterways support sustainable economic growth and the rejuvenation of, of local centres. Um, the LEP is interested to see how we can maximise the impact on sustainable, inclusive economic growth and support the organisations and people interested in using water-based resources. So, um, without more spiel, I'm going to, to hand straight over to Christian Sayer, who is the Senior Policy Officer in our PLACE team at the LEP, to take the floor. And um, Christian, over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Louise. Um, I'm going to try and uh, progress through this fairly quickly, as I'm aware we are running a little behind schedule. Um, as many of you listening will be well aware, um, the GBS LEP geography is crisscrossed by a wide variety of waterways, from the major waterways of the River Severn in the southeast to the Trent in the northwest to a host of smaller rivers, including the Tame, Ray, and Colne. Our canals are legendary, forming the transport infrastructure which drove the Industrial Revolution. The Birmingham Canal Network comprises of over 100 miles of canals stretching across the Lep region. However, despite providing the foundation for the growth of capitalism, the Industrial Revolution and the region as a whole, large sections of our waterways infrastructure en entered a period of steady decline throughout the 20th century. For many years, much of our waterways were almost viewed with embarrassment, culverted away and oft abandoned. The 1990s saw the beginning of the rejuvenation of some of our waterways, with the growth in waterside inner city developments, most noticeably the Brindley Place development, um, which further accelerated into the 21st century. So why at the LEP are we interested in waterways? We recognise the strength of our regional natural assets and believe our varied waterways will play a vital role in the transition to a net zero city region, as well as continuing to drive inclusive economic growth and rejuvenate some of our struggling areas and local centres. We are interested in going further forward than just using our waterways as a strong selling point for new residential developments and supporting organisations to maximise the potential these assets offer the region. Canals and rivers have well-documented positive economic impacts, including increasing footfalls to an area and boosting visitor economy, acting as catalysts for urban renaissance and tools for improving, improving housing offers, catalysts similarly for rural development and also economic diversification in such areas. Improvements of canal environments have been shown to bring forward developments of previously underutilised sites and uplift in land values brought about by development that positively addresses waterside locations can assist in making sites more viable for redevelopment and funding more interventions. Importantly, as we transition to net zero and greener cities and work to combat climate breakdown, they act as carbon sinks, reducing urban heat islands and improving air quality. They increase quality of life for residents through spaces for leisure activities and improving mental health and well-being, as well as improving biodiversity, cycle infrastructure and are key components to sustainable drainage systems. I'm just going to um, quickly rattle through and highlight some examples, both internationally and regionally, of projects which we believe have utilised waterways effectively. So first of all, we're just going to um, jump over to Seoul in South Korea. Um, I'm not going to pronounce the name and uh, mispronounce it dreadfully, um, but we have a, a, there was a congested stretch of elevated motorway was demolished and previously culverted waterway was uncovered to form a new public green space in the heart of the city. Whilst not without flaws, 
This project rejuvenated a moribund district, reduced heat island effects and air pollution, increased biodiversity and pedestrian and cycling use of the area as part of a wider car reduction strategy. Recent times have seen an increase in strong projects using our waterways to drive economic growth in the region, from the likes of Port Loop, mentioned earlier by Imi, uh, an urban island mixed-use development with the Port Loop and new mainline canals at its heart, to the roundhouse redevelopment. Local authorities and other organisations are increasingly recognising the benefits of utilising waterways to drive sustainable growth and developing existing projects and plans, uh, developing exciting projects and plans across our geography. The Battlefield Brook, which flows through Bronzegrove, was in 2018 renaturalised a longer stretch running through the main public park in the town, Sanders Park. Out came the concrete culvert through which it had been encased, and it, it ran into a newly dug natural channel with the bed and banks replanted with a variety of natural fauna. This visually improved the park, increasing the footfall to the park and residents' quality of life, while simultaneously also increasing biodiversity, sustainable drainage, and securing habitat for endangered species of water bog. Recently, plans have been published for the Ray Valley Urban Quarter a mixed-use redevelopment project planned for Digbeth, Birmingham. At the centre of this planned redevelopment is the opening up of the River Ray, which for a century has been culverted for large sections of its route hidden from view. The project proposes to not just provide an attractive setting for development, but also create a green corridor at the edge of the city centre, increasing biodiversity, acting as a carbon sink and reducing heat island and air pollution effects in the vicinity, and links up green infrastructure across the south of, Burn city, south of Birmingham city centre. The increased green space for leisure activities will provide an attractive destination for residents, visitors and businesses alike, and contribute to better quality of life for residents. As we have seen, Waterways often act as the anchor point for sustainable economic developments. The River Seven Partnership is a strong example of a large scale whole systems approach to waterways based economic development. Launched at the start of the year, led by the Environment Agency and bringing together local authorities, LEPs, including GBS LEP, water agencies, environmental organisations and other institutions it sets out to develop a coordinated approach across the seven catchment area, including three of the GBS led local authority areas. Combining a programme for economic growth with a strategic approach to water management, it has already success successfully gained a tranche of central government funding and believes that it's possible to bring an additional 36,000 hectares of land back into economic contribution to contribute to economic growth rising to an additional 11 billion of GVA per annum, whilst at the same time maximising carbon capture and increasing biodiversity throughout the catchment area. So, what next? Join us. Help us develop our frameworks so we can help you. We are interested in how the LEP can support you to maximise the potential of our waterways in driving sustainable, inclusive economic growth, bringing back to life moribund areas and forming a key network in the transition to a net zero global city region. Thank you. I'll pass back over to Louise now. Well, thank you so much, Christian. There is a huge amount um, that we can pick up with partners um, and include water as part of our regeneration and rejuvenation proposals. Um, I know that uh, uh, there are so many different organisations which are, are, are seeing this as a, 
a very important part of open space improvements, which has massive impacts on, on mental health and how communities can uh, work together. So yeah, brilliant examples. And we do have a plethora of waterways across our region and um, a re some really good examples of what we're actually doing at the moment and our aspirations to do more. Now, I know that we're running over time. I do apologize for that, but there's been so much stuff. It, was, it would seem very unfair to cut our speakers down. So um, really important to hear what they have been saying. Um, but because of that, Bjorn in Sweden has had to go to another meeting. He has uh, given us uh, a direct email and so we can raise any questions and perhaps discuss some of the examples that he raised in Malmo and across Sweden uh, in more detail. So do please feel free to get in touch with us and we can make sure that there is a dialogue that continues. One of the areas that I know that, uh, that he and I were going to pick up on uh, was the way that um, Scandinavia deals with climate and with light. Um, you know, it, it, it is not conducive to have a lot of open stuff, uh, an open air stuff uh, to regenerate our, our, um, our centres, our retail centres and our high streets when the weather is rubbish and it's dark and it's not very inviting. Scandinavia has and, and, and has shown how it can um, take that on board. And that one example of that lamp that moves around various local centres and regions uh, across a particular region is a really good example of how it can um, uh, be an attraction for uh, events and to, to bring a community together. There are lots and lots of really good examples across Sweden uh, and, and other parts of Scandinavia where um, outdoor activity happens all year round, not just in the summer. So Bjorn, um, thank you very much. I know that you've gone on to another, uh, another meeting, but we will pass on some of the questions. Now, it is obviously a, a complex area. There's lots of different um, angles that we can pick up on here, but there is a lot of very good work taking place across Greater Birmingham and further afield. So I'm going to pick up some of the questions that have come through the chat box and through the Q&A bit. But as a starter, while I try and work out the order of those, I'm going to just turn to each of our speakers in turn and kick off with one very obvious question. Given the breadth of work we cover as part of our place agenda under the LEP umbrella, what would you see as our most significant challenge or our starting point to reimagine our town centres? What do you see as the critical thing? So Mike, I'm going to turn to you first, if I may. Yes, thanks Louise. Uh, for me, and I think it's been a theme that some of our speakers have touched upon, um, we, we've got to begin thinking differently. And you know, some of the events of the past week have demonstrated that town centre futures are not going to be about national and international retailers. It's going to be about local. You know, the one thing that I think COVID has, has driven us all to, to realise is that local is key. Local producers, small independents, community-based projects and I think the future of the town centres has to be using that as the beginning and unthinking what we've been used to thinking over the last 30 or 40 years about what the solution to town centres is like. It's going to be a very different future based I think around small local community. Thank you. Um, uh, Sala? Yeah I think obviously Covid is, is a big challenge um, looking at from a cultural sector perspective that particular sector is one of the worst affected together with hospitality, uh, etc. So it is really kind of working together. I think it's really important that we, we really collaborate, we really think about places, we really think about what we want to achieve here and for who. Um, and, and, and I think there's also great opportunities around things like the HS2, which is still going ahead. Um, and the fact that people are looking for places to live uh, that are perhaps perhaps a little bit less uh, urban and and what does that then mean in terms of developing the, the type of places and areas where people want to move and live in which then help us will, will help us to kind of recover from all of this thank you now Imi you are the you are the community queen I have to say <laughs> what do you see as a priority clearly community is vital and, and, and very important in your world and your field of area what complements that what what else should we as a place board be looking at um i think very very clearly it's about investment logics right um at the end of the day um it isn't 
it isn't a whole swathe of terrible people that we don't know sitting in some office somewhere trying to put lots of private developers into places where um that that where a range of big and small and medium sized and different actors like i actually probably agree that centering community small local is going to be important i still don't think it will be the only